Warning. The following episode discusses the year 2000 horror film Supernova and contains explicit sexual contents, including discussions of sexual violence. A complete list of content warnings can be found in the episode description. Please proceed with caution. Supernova is a film about bodies. a show offering critical analysis and contextualization of the horror films of the early 2000s. I'm your host, Macaulay Elijah Quinn. I'm a filmmaker and film critic, and on today's episode I'll be discussing with you January 2000's Supernova, a film which has a lot to say about sex and relationships, none of it good. (laughs) So I've now watched Supernova, I think, a total of three times. Um, A little bit of background... When I was originally coming up with the idea of this show, when I was just sort of kicking it around, um, I wanted to see whether or not it was viable for me to do this. Um, And so I picked just like a couple of films at random from throughout the 2000s, um, just to sort of see, is there enough content here? Like, will I have enough to say to fill like a 20 minute episode? Um, and so this was one of the films that I watched because I knew that it would be the first one that I actually covered when it came to recording. And so I kind of knew what to expect going in this time. Um, but even so, it was really just shocking to me how horny this movie is. (laughs) From its opening moments, it's like really clear that this is a movie that is about sex. Like, characters are doing it, they're talking about it. The world that they live in is defined by it, is how I've put it here in my notes. Quite literally, they're living aboard this, like, big phallic... It it looks like a vibrator. It looks like some sort of bizarre sex toy. I've been in shops that have sold this exact device. I don't want to get too much into just doing, like, a plot recap. I'm not going to cover this beat by beat, but... I wanted to, I suppose, talk about how the film opens because I think it's really instructive for just the tone of the film as a whole. Ignoring the, like, generic Star Wars opening, the, like, shot of space with a ship that, like, comes in from off-frame, Supernova actually, like, properly opens in the sleeping quarters of the computer technician Benjamin, um, who has a very weird relationship. I'm going to talk a bit more in detail about the relationship that he has with uh, the computer's artificial intelligence uh, called Sweetie. Um, But basically she wakes him up in the middle of the night um, to play a game of chess. Um, And then immediately after that, we smash cut to uh, two medical technicians, uh, a guy named Yerzy and a woman named Danica, who are having sex in the ship's anti-gravity chamber. So, like, immediately it's clear that the film wants you thinking about sex uh, and wants you thinking about sexual relationships. Danica and Yezzy's relationship is, I think, where the filmmakers are most obviously engaging with these themes. In the film's first act, Nick, uh, James Spader's character, is talking about the crew. Um, he's just sort of like running down his his first impressions of, of everybody. And he talks about how Danica and Yerzy, they're just off in like any corner that they can find. Um, they're just like going at it like rabbits. And Angela Bassett's character, rather than saying like, oh, well, that's like, that's none of your business. Like, just, you know, fucking leave it, mate. Uh, instead, she frames it as, well, that's like, that's how you survive out here. 
that's you know you you find comfort where you can when you're out in space and you're a million miles away from you know anyone and anything you need to you need companionship um and so the relationship i guess is presented as being sort of frivolous um it's just sort of a a way of filling time of like keeping your mind um occupied while while nothing is happening at the beginning of the second act though after uh captain marley has passed away the relationship is reframed the two characters are again they're engaged in sex and so we're sort of the film has like tuned us to be thinking about their relationship as frivolous and so we're led to believe sort of initially that this is again the characters just finding comfort in each other um you know their their commanding officer has just passed away presumably their friend um has just passed away and so they are you know they're just they're engaging in sex as a way of of feeling close to another person but then afterwards yuzi produces uh this document he has apparently off screen he has approached um some sort of governmental authority um and received an an application form to allow himself and danica to have a child um in the future you need to apply for a permit um to be allowed to to give birth um to bear children this immediately changes the dynamic of the relationship or the way that we are meant to understand the relationship suddenly it goes from being a frivolous relationship one that is like physical and nothing more to oh no this relationship has a point it is it is good it is meaningful it has purpose it, it they want to bear a child and that is just inherently good and i'm framing it in these terms because i believe that there's some really clear ideology at play in this film about what sex should be the filmmakers and when i talk about the filmmakers here i'm not talking about any one individual i'm not saying that that walter hill or jack shoulder or whoever else believes this to be true but what i am saying is that the film has a message and whether or not that was intended is something that could be you know debated until the cows come home i'm not here to relitigate death of the author for you all but i think that it's very clear that the film wants us to believe that sex is about the creation of life and that is it and that to engage with sex for any other reason whether that be to exert power over another person or for just personal pleasure that is in some way wrong or perhaps like morally reprehensible let's say i think it's really interesting to note here that danica and yerzy both die uh as a result of sex that they have had outside of their relationship sex that is bad because it is being done solely for pleasure the characters have given into temptation and so they they must die that's how this works that's how this film presents it what tipped this film over the edge for me from being just a film that had weird sexual politics to a film that had actively bad sexual politics was the relationship between uh the computer technician benjamin and uh the computer's artificial intelligence sweetie this relationship is i think deliberately queer coded i think that it would be very easy to read this as being an asexual relationship the two characters are very very flirtatious with one another um they enjoy playing playing chess i almost said playing sex there that is because chess i think is as close as these characters ever come uh to <laughs> to sex um there's a couple of different instances where this comes up like Danica and Yerzy's Benjamin's relationship with Sweetie is initially framed negatively uh being presented as like strange or aberrant the difference being that their relationship is never reframed in the way that uh the aforementioned couple was and i think that this makes sense because if we're if we're to take this film at its word that sex is only good or can only be good uh when it is done with the intention of bearing a child then it makes sense 
that Benjamin's relationship with Sweetie, which can necessarily not bear a child, is bad. It is a bad relationship. It is it is lesser and it is worthy of derision. It's interesting then to think about the way that um, Nick and Kayla's romance is like presented in the film, because. It really only exists in one scene at the beginning of the film's second act, uh, where the two characters share a drink following Captain Marley's death. Um, it's it's implied here um, that the two characters sleep together um, following this short scene, but pretty much immediately afterwards, Nick is stranded um, on Titan 37 by Carl, and he's not seen again until the beginning of the film's climax. And so otherwise, outside of a professional context, the characters, they've, they've hardly ever interacted. Their relationship, though, is good. And I know this because at the end of the day, Kayla is going to give birth to Nick's child. And that is framed as being more respectable than a sexually aberrant relationship built on mutual love and respect between Benjamin and Sweetie. Benjamin's death is, I think, the most repugnant part of the film. Um, it is just absolutely terrible. Benjamin uh, manages to hurt Carl, um, manages to uh, successfully trap him inside of uh, a, a part of the ship um, where he is able to, to section himself off, but uh, Sweetie is unable to alter her programming in time to be able to save his life. So, it is the queerness of the relationship that ultimately kills him. It is the fact that he has fallen in love with an artificial intelligence, um, a, a computer uh, that is bound by uh, programming that, that ultimately kills him. And I think it's really just horribly distasteful. <laughs> I want to take a moment just to talk about some of the some of the notes that I've taken um, throughout the film, some of the more, I guess, sexually explicit uh, sort of notes. I've already mentioned the uh, the phallic ship design, um, the way that it looks like a marital aid. Oh, the dimensional jump. I haven't even mentioned this yet. The dimensional jump, uh, when that happens, is... I have it written down here as Yonic to the point of parody. Um... Never, not since, not since Star Trek, the, the motion picture, have I seen such just explicitly vaginal imagery. <laughs> oh yeah, this is a weird note. So Kayla, Angela Bassett's character, uh, explains that she had been in a physically abusive relationship in the past, um, where, where later told that it was Carl Larson, um, who did this. And... Sexual assault is implied um, because the doctor says that once it was over, she was unable to bear children. Um, and I think that's very strange. I think that's a very unusual way for the filmmakers to, to talk about all of this. We're introduced to uh, Carl Larson in the nude, um, and it's implied that he has a big dick. One of Carl's first acts aboard the ship is to cuck old Jersey. I find this really, really funny. Pretty much immediately after waking up, uh, he begins flirting with Danica. And she's really receptive to it. Um, he manages to convince her that she should sleep with him because it would help her to decide whether or not she truly wants to have a child with Yerzy or not. This is the sex scene that uh, shows her failing uh, the filmmaker's expectations, falling short of the filmmaker's expectations. This is the reason that she has to die, because she, because she is a cuckold. <laughs> so I've not yet talked about uh, the the film's MacGuffin, uh, the, the ninth dimensional object, uh, which in my notes I have just repeatedly called the space egg. The space egg, this ninth dimensional object, uh, it is, it is described as being an object of creation. Um, it is, it is an object of metamorphosis or, or of change. Um, it is 
said that it will permanently rewrite existence as we know it uh within the plot that is sort of i guess the the big threat is what what will happen uh if carl is allowed to utilize this this object i think it's pretty clear that what this object actually is is a stand-in for sex um big brain moment here <laughs> Upon first discovering the object, um, Danica immediately comments that it looks like a dildo. Um, Yearzy falls sort of madly in love uh, with <laughs> with the space egg um, to the point where uh, he there is a sex scene between himself and the object uh, in which he penetrates it with his fist. The egg is seen like pulsating and there is uh some moaning uh laid into the soundtrack it brings yearsy a, a massive amount of pleasure uh to be doing this and when we see him uh you know a little a little bit later he's seen completely nude uh cradling the object the contact that he has with the egg is what ultimately kills him it is it is the fact that he becomes obsessed with uh with the egg that uh drives him to fight with Carl um and ultimately to die so again we're seeing this framing um this presentation of sex as being you know if it, if it's done for pleasure then it's bad the film ends with the space egg uh reacting with the gravitational pull of the blue giant star um and as a result of uh carl's actions earlier in the film um, where he had destroyed the dimensional stabilization pods um aboard the ship um carl and no sorry kayla and nick are forced to seal themselves into one um pod they're designed for a single person nick and kayla though are forced to strip naked and they uh jump into the pod um where they embrace one another and the dimensional jump uh that occurs results in them sharing dna um it's some like neg negligible amount um but it does result in kayla becoming pregnant again just to reiterate Nick and Kayla throughout the film have had a really combative relationship. Um, they had one moment of sort of emotional closeness, but their relationship is is ultimately good. Um, and we're supposed to feel good about them being together because of the involvement of a child. <laughs> I think that'll probably do it for this episode. Supernova is a very weird film, and I don't think that I would recommend that you watch it. Um, it has some very, I think, outdated views on sex and sexual politics, um, which I just personally found very, very hard to stomach. I'd like to thank Yanka Glonis for the use of her track Slime Dripping Down the Walls off of the album Fun Time Party Gal. A link to that album and to their band camp can be found in the episode description. Uh, if you have any comments or queries regarding the show and you want to get in touch, you can do that either on Twitter at MostMaligned or via email MostMaligned at gmail.com. If you enjoyed this episode, I'd ask that you please consider supporting the show at patreon.com forward slash MostMaligned, where for just $5 a month, you'll receive exclusive access to Take Two, a semi-weekly show offering critical analysis and contextualization of those films which for one reason or another, have not made it onto the main feed. Next week, we'll be discussing February 2000's Cabin by the Lake, a sort of post-scream slasher film made for the USA Network. And until then, this has been the Most Maligned Horror Podcast.